Hi, this is Lainey Cameron, and I am excited to be here with Sue Ann Schaefer. And today we're going to talk about a book that I like the idea that it's a new year. Why not introduce you to some new stories you might not have heard yet? So we're going to be talking about Sue Ann's book, Hunting the Devil. Thanks for joining me. Hi. And so let's start at the beginning. Tell me a little bit more about Hunting the Devil and where the inspiration came from. Okay. Well, I had actually started um, a shape-shifting lion book, and it just never seemed to go anywhere. But I really liked the heroine. And then, so I had her pretty much. And then um, my son and I went to Tanzania, and he, I adopted this young black boy. And um, so I think I went to go on safari, and he went thinking he might reconnect with his ancestors or something. When he got there, he had some real issues with, you know, being treated as white because he was with a white woman, but he, you know, outwardly is black. And so he had lots of uh, confusion. And so I took that and combined it with this heroin and the trip to Tanzania and came up with hunting the devil. You know, when I had this protagonist, I wanted to put her in the worst possible situation a woman could be in. Right. And uh, so I chose that genocide. And, and, and then, let's, take a, let's take a quick peek at a review because I know this book has some lovely reviews. And this is from Camille DeMeo, who's actually been on this interview series in the past. She's a big historical fiction writer. Yeah. And I loved what she said here. She says, it made me feel like I had a front row view of the atrocities in Rwanda, yet smoothed it by placing it from the viewpoint of a woman who loved the people so dearly. And I also appreciated her point that it really sparked an interest in a subject that she she knew relatively little about and made her want to go find out more. And she calls that the hallmark of excellent writing. What a lovely thing to have Camille say about your book. Yeah, yes. Camille is a wonderful woman. I've known her for quite a few years now. So how did the book change? I mean, we both know as writers that the books often, as you go through editing, right, things get cut, things things get added, things get combined. Like, give us a sense of what changed in this book from earlier versions. Well, I sent it off to the editors. It was 108,000 words. It's like I was trying to get it down to 100,000. And so she went through and cut a 10-line paragraph, and that was it. Oh. It's like, well, that's no help. <laughs> and so by the time I made the changes she suggested, it came up to 118,000 words. So it's like, Alicia, you're not helping here. 118 <laughs> is too much, right, for a woman's fiction book. And But she said, um, some stories just take more words. And I'm a pretty lean writer. And so she says it's 118,000 words that you really needed every word. Well, I'm not sure about that, but. Anyway, it now tops at 118,000 words. Wow. But people have read the whole book in a day because they cannot put it down. That's high praise right there. Yes, it is. So anything you'd want to tell a potential reader, like who would really appreciate this book? What kind of reader will, will really appreciate and, and find value in this book? Mm. Anyone who likes a strong woman and... Um, Basically, the story is that this uh, young doctor goes to Rwanda. She's going to work a year in a medical mission. And while she's there, she gets trapped in a genocide. And so she can't get out. She actually leaves with the 250,000 people who cross the border from Rwanda into Tanzania. And she ends up at the Banaco uh, refugee camp. And uh, so she ends up finally working there as a doctor because she's looking for the man who killed her children. She had adopted two or tried to adopt two baby boys and uh, had, you know, the typical run-ins with the government that just wouldn't let things happen. So when they were killed, she had nothing left in the country. So she evacuated. And uh, so she spends the next several years trying to track down the man who killed the children. So it's this, you know, sort of a vigilante novel because yeah, she's going to do this one way or another. 
Wow. And she does. <laughs> Wow, so that's fascinating. Wow, and talk about a book that takes you out of your your regular world to a place you wouldn't normally go, right? Well, obviously, at 68, I was alive when this was going on. I was also in my last year of medical school and, uh, you know, trying to graduate and all that sort of stuff. And looking at what was going on and looking through all of the um, Time Magazine and Newsweek and stuff like that, it just was not a big deal. And, you know, 800,000 people were killed in 100 days. And actually, if you look, compare the news coverage, O.J. Simpson and uh, Tanya and um, the skating incident got more coverage than the genocide did. Wow. Wow. And, it's hard to go from there to another topic because this is such a heavy, important subject. But uh what about uh, reading? Have you read anything good recently? I actually just finished uh, an advanced reader's copy of a book called uh, Outlawed by Anna North. And it's really, I guess you could call it a genre bending book because it's a Western, it's post apocalyptic, <laughs> and it has this huge cast of non binary women who are basically outlaws with the Hole of the Wall Gang. And it was really nice because there was such broad coverage of non-binary people. Hmm. And I really enjoyed it. And I just love the fact that, you know, it, I'm a Texan and I was raised on Westerns and this little book just flipped him. Oh, awesome. <laughs> you know, so it was a fun read. And then I also have, uh, have you read Rosary Without Beads? Mm -hmm. by um, Diana Hogan Ballog. Anyway, she is, uh, I think she lives in New Mexico. But this book is uh, <clears throat> the story of Billy the Kid told her the point of view of a young Latina who falls in love with him. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I had read the book when it first came out, I think in 2000. 10 or something like that but this was the audio book and the, the woman who what's her name uh daniela medrano her voice is so perfect for this book that i just loved the book all over again just hearing it because she was superb and then another book that came out in 2008 but has been sitting on my to be read list was a guide to the birds of East Africa by Nicola Strayson. And it's set in Nairobi and it's sort of a strange little book. It's about birding, but about hum <clears throat> human nature and two men who are in love with the same woman and how that all resolves. So it's a cute read, but it's so, you know deeper than just cute. So that's my favorite books for the last couple of weeks. That's great. The unusual recommendations. I don't often get Westerns brought up. So that's kind of fun to hear some different ones. Or East Africa. <laughs> East Africa. Which, well, that fits that uh, you're interested in Africa. Um, so what about writing advice? Um, this isn't your first book. And so you've been at this for a while. You're really engaged with women's fiction writers. Um, what would you advise people who are a few steps behind you in the journey who are maybe working to get their book out there or working on, on the first one or like what writing advice do you have? I would say just keep writing and, you know, study your craft. I, but also I think you need to find your, your tribe, so to speak. And I, uh, I looked for a long time online and I just, you know, didn't find people I was compatible with. and. Um, so I eventually found the San Antonio chapter of Romance Writers of America and got in with them and they didn't hold it against me that I wrote women's fiction instead of romance. But they sat through a lot of the um, uh, critique sessions and stuff that really helped my books come together. And also at a certain point I decided I didn't really know how to write and that I should probably learn. And so I went online and it's like, oh, there's Stanford University. That's a good school. <laughs> so I applied to their online novel writing program and they only accepted 15 people around the world the year I applied. And so it was a close knit group with some really 
great professors, and I'm still in touch with most of the people. And then we exchange books and read and critique and stuff like that. So I think, you know, just finding those relationships and holding on to them. <laughs> right. And um, anything we didn't cover before I show folks how they can connect with you? I think that's about it. So let's take a quick peek at how people can connect, both readers and writers. You're at Sue Ann Schaefer on Instagram and SueAnnSchaeferAuthor.com. And I know on your website, you do some really interesting things. Talk about this for a sec. You do um, author interviews, right? I know at one point you put yeah. my own interview up on your site. Like, Tell us a little about some of the things you put up on your site. Well, I um, have author interviews on Tuesday. And on Thursdays, I put out like a 300-word book review. You know, just enough to, I don't rehash the plot or anything like that. It's just, I like this because. And uh, I'm sure enough that people can read it quickly because the interviews tend to be considerably longer. So I try to balance that out. And uh, I think there's some pictures from my trip to Tanzania and uh, a blurb for my editing services because I'm a real nitpicky editor. And... Um, I guess that's it. Awesome. Well, it has been a pleasure to talk with you today. Thanks. Bye-bye.